Thank you very much for staying on the program. Now, police in Wa say the suspect, they suspect foul play in the death of a five-year-old girl, the deceased known as Mufidatu, was earlier reported missing by her parents on Thursday, but was today found dead. The body of the child was found on a cesspit in an uncompleted two-bedroom house. Our correspondent Rafiq Salam uh, has details and he's joined us over the line with more. Hello, Rafiq. Hello, Camille. Now, what do we know about why the police suspect foul play? Um, according to the uh, public relations of the, of the Ghana Police Service uh, in the upper West region, I went to Afabaji AAC. Uh, he told us that they are suspecting foul play uh, because uh, when they removed uh, the decomposed body of the girl, they saw that uh, they were marked on their skull. And then the other uh, thing that they are suspecting was that part, uh, her private part uh, was not there. And so they suspected that it might be used for ritual uh, purposes. And so that is the situation uh, currently. But he's saying that that's notwithstanding, they're still going ahead with their investigation. Very well. Now, take us back to when uh, this young child went missing. Um, it was on Thursday uh, in the evening. Uh, there was a heavy downpour in the one municipality here. And so immediately after the rains, according to the parents uh, of this uh, girl, uh, the father, the name is Yao Asane. Uh, he went to the police station, the company of the mother, to report the, the issue to the war police. And so after lodging that uh, complaint to the police about the missing girl, um, uh, they went to the radio station to do announcement. So it was this morning that a neighbor uh, who tells a local people uh, right uh, uh, in between their house and also this uncompleted structure where the lady was found, was sleeping. And then so he swept his compound, and after some time, uh, he realized that he, he smelled uh, some uh, spongent uh, smell around the vicinity. And so she looked around uh, and saw flies coming from the own computer structure just in front of her. Now, so, what have the parents of uh, Mufidatu been saying? Uh, the parents are not really happy. Uh, even when I tried to their father, Yao Asana, uh, he couldn't just uh, uh, hold himself uh, after taking some few remarks, uh, he went into uh, tears. But for them, initially, uh, when the lady reported that he saw uh, somebody lying in that suspect, they didn't believe that that was their girl because they think that the girl was still alive until they saw her being pulled out of the suspect and then they saw the beat and then the, the, the dress that she was wearing, he showed that. That was really the idea. Now, since finding the body of a child, what's been the general reaction from the community? Uh, the people in the community are really shocked about uh, what uh, uh, happened. And even the one now see the people, now the city people sent a delegation uh, to the area and then also uh, to find out uh, what actually happened. And so the people really are really shocked. But uh, according to the police, they are saying that they are going to go deep into the matter to find the culprit of this heinous crime. We'll leave it here. Thank you very much, Rafiq. Now, pupils of Buoko DA Primary School in the Winchim municipality of the Bonahalfa region want government to build a six-unit classroom block. They think it is time authorities give them at least the basic needs to make school appealing. Correspondent Nesta Kafuya Juma sent this report after interacting with pupils at Buoko. Buoku DA Primary School was established 10 years ago with two teachers and 10 pupils. It has grown to 300 pupils and 13 teachers. Even though government took over the school in 2007, the school still grapples with inadequate infrastructure. Vision Query Company provided this six-unit classroom, which is currently used by the upper primary school. The Parent Teacher Association also erected this makeshift structure for the preschool and upper primary. The school closes down whenever rain clouds gather. Pupils struggle to find learning perches in swampy classrooms, the inevitable result of a rainy day. Due to the structure of the building, we have to close the school anytime it rains. On other days, the sun scorches us. This makes learning difficult. We want government to build new classrooms. Another 
Another serious challenge confronting the school is sanitation. The structure made from palm branches serves as the urinal, whilst this pit with logs over it is being used as the toilet facility. The PTA chairman told Joy News they have made all attempts to get assistance from the Winchi Municipal Assembly, but they keep receiving empty promises. So this time, he addressed his concerns to central government. <laughs> We constructed the current structure ourselves. We have pursued the district assembly to help us, but they keep tossing us about. The teachers permit the children to go home when it rains. This is risky. We appeal to government to aid us. Irrespective of these challenges, Boku DA Primary School celebrated its 10th anniversary with an energetic performance from the school's cultural troupe. Although executives of the municipality were invited, the sent delegations who could not give any concrete responses to the challenges facing the school. Ifia Jama Ampofuedu is the headmistress of the school. Even in the dry season, where there is no rain, the sun always often moves to the classrooms. When the sun blows, the whirling wind moves a lot of particles to the classroom, blows even papers away. Then the furniture too is woefully inadequate. Now let's go to the Talency constituency where it was a storm of rallies yesterday. The small town in the eastern region has become a hotbed of political activity as candidates gear for the July 7 polls. Everyone who is anyone in the political scene was at Talency. The president, John Ramani Mahama, was at the rally for the NDC, while the leader of the biggest opposition party, Nana Dadanko Akufado, took the podium at the rally for for the new patriotic party. And Pakwesi Indum, uh, founder and leader of the Progressive People's Party, also addressed the crowd at his party's rally. Following the triple rally weekend, please uh, ha have increased visibility in the area ahead of tomorrow's election. Let's get the latest from there now. Correspondent Albert Soros joined us over the telephone. Hello, Albert. Hello, Kenny. Now, what's the, what's the general mood in Talenti? Well, the uh, mood is one of uh, expectation and anxiety uh, ahead of tomorrow, but there aren't any uh, busy campaign activities going on. Uh, yesterday was was the two big rallies, so the town was very busy with heavy security. Two days or three days uh, before uh, the rallies, if you came to this place, you'd find uh, a lot of you know, party people driving branded vehicles and, you know, making noise, chanting campaign songs and all of that. But today, all that uh, seems to be missing. Uh, I've been here since 10 a.m. and it doesn't, uh, today looks so different from the rest of the day, um, you know, before the by election. Everything seems to be a little calmer mm. uh, than usual. Well, we understand there's heavy security presence all the same in Talency. Tell us about it. Well, heavy security presence was yesterday, but all that uh, is no longer seen. Um, I've been here, like I said, for more than two hours now. Um, I've seen one or two police vehicles drive by, uh, but there isn't, um, you know, high security. Because yesterday, uh, the road that links Congo to Congo, where the two rallies uh, were held, they had two roadblocks on it. Today, the roadblocks have been taken off. And so... Uh, there isn't high security at the moment at all. I see. Now, you have also been interacting with the EC in that area. What have they been telling you as far as your preparedness is concerned? Well, the EC, um, I'm currently speaking to you from uh, the premises where the EC office is, and there's a lot of activity going there, obviously, um, as they get ready for tomorrow. Um, the EC's uh, regional officer, uh, chair, I should say, has been uh, talking about the fact that they are ready for uh, any unforeseen circumstances. Uh, but that remains to be seen because tomorrow will be the election. And so issues of uh, the shortages of fingerprints and all of that um, will be 
will likely be seen if there will be any difficulties. It will be tomorrow that we'll be able to sell uh, all of these things. Well, thank you very much, Albert. Albert Sorry joined us from the Talency Constituency. Now, a former ambassador to the Organization of African Unity has taken a swipe at the current leadership of the African Union for failing to live up to its expectations. And Ambassador Ibeneza Moses Deborah says the organization was created with the aim of making Africa dependent and not over reliant on foreign donors for survival. He says Africa has what it takes to generate its own funds to support its developmental projects. Bowie is a bigger group, you know, and this is it. But it's important that all of us must know that it is in our interest to have one Africa unit, one Africa working for our good and and if we'll be strong like the US or the USSR if we work together and come out together. So we shouldn't be disappointed. We should work much harder because it looks as if um, everything is slow and slow and slow. But no. From it's, mm -hmm. But we should work hard to make sure we win the union, which you come on talking about. Uh, from where you sit, mm -hmm. would you say that successive governments have disappointed us? Who? Successive governments. Those, those, no, those I would, I would, no, I wouldn't use the word disappointed because uh, I, should, I would say they should try harder and all of us should also try to work towards mm -hmm. African things. You know, I, I always say that we should not import things like beef from other places mm -hmm. where there's sufficient beef in Africa, and we, Africa can feed itself and therefore generate the money. It is necessary that we do that because nobody can save Africa except the African himself. Well, there are more stories when we return to stay. Thanks for staying on the program. Now, the poor will find it more difficult to get access to electricity if government goes ahead with the privatization of the electricity company of Ghana. This is the assessment of former UK diplomat Craig Murray, who also served as Deputy High Commissioner to Ghana. He also said that the IMF and the United States of America are responsible for our current economic woes. Fred Smith has been reading the statement and shared details with us earlier. Ten years ago, uh, Ghana was uh, producing the most reliable power. Uh, the uh, supply was the most reliable on the continent. In fact, it had the highest percentage of households connected to the grid. And this includes South Africa. So you know uh, how efficient VRA was at the time. But then Ghana went to the IMF for some assistance, and the conditionality was that we break up generation from supply. And that's how come we had great coal in between and we also had independent power producers also coming on board. Uh, what he says is that today our power, our power generation is half what we were producing 10 years ago mm -hmm. and in, in spite of the inclusion of these IPPs and the break of the supply uh, chain. Uh, he thinks that the United States and the IMF uh, have this agenda to ensure that the siphon monies from the poor and to rich companies, uh, mainly the United States companies, so they will be wealthier. And he's warning that if you're not careful and we go ahead with the privatization of the electricity company of Ghana, uh, what will happen is that there will be more efficiency in revenue collection, which means that if you're a, if you're a hospital and you're delaying the payment of your electricity, what happens is that you are cut off, no mercy uh, for you. And he thinks that it is the poor that's going to bear the brunt mm. of this privatization. Uh, well, he makes an interesting revelation also about the uh, independent power producers, uh, the fact that they, uh, they contribute little and uh, give us uh, some uh, details. In, in fact, he's, he's saying that of all the independent power producers who are making the most of the money that's generated in the power sector, uh, they contribute less than 20% of the total uh, power generation and so uh, there's a dis disconnect there produce 
less and, but and, and the and, most and, 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 and he also diagnosed the problem going forward if we uh, go ahead to privatize ECG uh, well uh, the obvious thing is to reverse the decision to privatize uh, let it be in the hands of uh, the ECG let's have one unified VRA that's more efficient so that it can provide the supplies that they were doing uh, some 10 years ago well, let's dwell on this for a bit longer. I'm joined over the telephone by Director of Research and Policy at the Africa Center for Energy and Policy, John Peter Mehu. Hello, hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on the program, Mr. Mehu. Yeah, good afternoon and good afternoon to your listeners. Now, is, is Ambassador Murray justified when he blames our current woes as a country on the IMF and uh, the United States of America, as far as the interference in our, in our energy sector is concerned. Hello, come again, please. The line is very quick. I'm asking if Ambassador Murray is justified in blaming the current woes on the country uh, on, uh, on, on the IMF and the United States of America for their interference in our energy sector. <laughs> Well, of course, I, I will not discuss, uh, discuss it as a disappearance. Uh, it is we as a country that have uh, uh, brought ourselves to this current uh, circumstances. But largely, I think he's right by saying that, you know, uh, consumers are the benefit of course, who end up, you know, uh, saying more. Uh, the basic reason is that whether you describe it as privatization or construction, uh, you are opening now a largely held public entity into the hands of a private sector management. The private agenda of any organization is profit motivation, and that is at the last end of it. You know, nobody comes to do anything because it's a father Christmas. And so, depending on the extent of privatization that we're talking about, yes, of course, there's going to be an added, added cost. That added cost will come as a result, you know, uh, either through management or injection mm. of uh, capital. Now, so if all this Mr. Mewu, let's, let's start from the beginning. In chronicling event, uh, Mr. Mori makes uh, mention of the breaking up of VRA into generation, transmission, and then supply. And, and he feels that that was where we went wrong, wrong as a country. What do you make of that? No, 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 at all. You know, VRA as a generator, uh, there is nothing wrong if we have a transmission organization separately for a generation institution. All that it means is that there's elements of protection. You know, uh, if you keep on doing one thing over and over again, you become more used to it and you expect to reduce costs through that process. So generators all over the world are far different from transmitters. You know, in Ghana, we have a Greek which is doing the high... Uh, level but, but Mr. Mewu, from, from, from the, the figures that Mr. Murray has given in his article, then indeed something has not worked for us. For instance, he tells us that prior to uh, the breaking up of, of VRA into the various uh, institutions we know now, we produce about 1,800 1, megawatts of power. We break them down 10 years down the line, we're producing half of what we, we, used, we used to produce. Obviously, then, it hasn't worked for us. Perfectly, I agree with you. But the reason why we've not been able to produce much is not because of the breakdown of uh, generation from transmission. You agree, it's because of the, uh, the management of the hydro. We have had problems all over this U.A. as a result of our hydro management. Nobody controls when the rain is going to fall. So the lack of the hydro management, as much as we can do that to human effort, largely is also a, a, as a result of an act of God. And so I totally disagree if they think that the breaking down of the generator from the transmitter, you know, is largely where it created this problem. I, I disagree. Because the, the difficulty we have over the U.A. has to do with large distribution and transmission losses, which are more technical. And now if you bring in an aspect to cut down those distribution losses, don't forget somewhere last year, distribution losses were as far as high as twenty eight percent. As I speak, I think we are in the region of twenty three, twenty four percent. And so if management is able to bring down these losses that we we've been incurring previously, I don't think that any, you know, a person will have to argue that because we are able to uh, you know separate mm. distribution 
issue from transmission is a cause of the problem. Uh, in, we in, have in, management problems, which mm. I agree, perfect. Mm. In, opening, in opening up the markets, we introduce independent power producers. Now, according to the statement also, independent, independent power producers contribute only about 20% of all, of all of the power we produce as a country, and yet recoup about 60% of the revenue that, that comes out of the sale of power in, in the country. And you can only yeah, imagine is, where the 60% go, because a lot of the IPPs are foreign-owned. Yes, of course, the IPP, the 20% that we're talking about, these IPPs are not able to come in out to effect. As I speak to now, there are more than 15 IPPs that have been signed down. The trigger for the IPP to enter the systems are not clear. So there's no that clear signal that is allowing the IPP to come because we have a single ball register, which is the ECG. The ECG has one of the worst balances in this country. And so I, as an IPP, if I'm going to produce for the ECG, and the ECG has a government. It doesn't give me the trigger to produce. So mm -hmm. the reason why we're having generation losses in terms of lack of generation coming into the grid is also because the ITPs are not coming on board. And the ITPs are not coming on board because they are not getting a good signal from the person who is buying from them, which is the ETP. And mm -hmm. that is why some of us have the view that if you want to privatize ETP, it has not to do only with the management, as we are talking about consumption. ETP doesn't have to do with capitalization. We need to Utilize the balance sheet of ETP and make ETP attractive to the IPP for the IPP to generate. And, and that is what I think. So if you just say construction and you go and bring in some white man to do management, well, that management can reduce some of the inefficiency that we So, Mr. Mel, what do ETP has to do with money? Capitalization. What, 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 what do we do now as a country? Because then we have taken off the MCA which gives us conditionalities on how to improve our, our power sector, which brought up the conversation of ECG privatization. On the other hand, we have the IMF, which is very much concentrated on making revenues from ECG, paying realistic uh, prices and then uh, realistic tariffs and making a lot of money from the power sector through the ECG. It, it, it seems as though there's a lot of concentration on distribution. Very little attention is paid to, to supply. What do we do now as a country? Well, the concentration on distribution, again, has to do with the losses. And so if you pay so much attention to distribution and you're able to reduce the distribution losses to about 15%, of course, it creates more excess power, you know, at the generation side. You see, what is important is not always being generation or supply. If you are generating a lot of power and those powers are not getting to the user at the end of the benefit, then, of course, there's no need to generate so if you're able to address the problem which leads to the losses within that system, which largely in Ghana has to do with the distribution losses, if you're able to tackle that problem, you end up saving a lot from the generation point. Okay? Again, going back to the uh, IMF or the, uh, uh, the Millennium Challenge uh, Authority, you know, it, it's as a result of what we want as a country. The Americans are not coming here to help us because they like Ghana. They are also business entities. If they are giving us money and they say, well, we want our people to get into our power sector, not because they can do it better, but it's because they can also get some revenue out of the system. So I think as a whole country, we, we're getting a lot of things that are not right. And this has to do with our policy. Mm. So I agree largely with, with the gentleman's point of view. But I also disagree with him, but the fact that we have, you know, created the distribution, uh, transmission, you know, and then the terms of generation, mm. Uh, from the former largely monopolistic uh, VRA, that's well. what we bring us to. That, that is the point I disagree with. We'll yeah. leave it here. Thank you very much. John Peter Amewu is with the Africa Center for Energy Policy. The mayor of Accra, Alfred Okuvandapoy, stuck by his words and carried out the final phase of the demolition exercise at Old Fadama early Sunday. The exercise followed a series of meetings between the AMA and the leadership of Old Fadama on the strategy to remove Sodom and Gomorrah from the map of Accra. Joy News' Latif Idris was at the site and reports residents watched on helplessly as their structures were pulled down by the AMA task force. The final phase of the demolition exercise, according to the mayor, will only affect areas around Adedengpo and those earmarked for the Kole Lagoon Ecological Restoration Project. These residents were therefore well aware of the demolition, but defied the orders and stage. They watched on helplessly as their properties are bulldozed. Some could not hold back their tears. 
My structure has been pulled down. I have five children and my business has collapsed now. I pay my children's school fees with this business. I earn my living from this business and now has been pulled down. I have no place to go. <laughs> Victoria is watching on helplessly as the structure is being pulled down. And now the big question she's asking is where is she going from here? She has kids, her businesses, everything is being pulled down by the AMA. The young men who have always called this place home say they have nowhere to go. I, I feel bad because this morning they come here this morning, they told us that they will do only the quarter side, you understand? So after uh, they just start to the restaurant everywhere. everywhere. So we, we don't want someone to stay. So some of them, where they, where they want us to go and stay. You see. Uh, so so where would you go from here? So I, I don't have any place to go. There's no money to go. If the mayor's words are anything to go by, this will be the last demolition exercise in the neighborhood of Old Fadama. But residents here say they are skeptical about the mayor's promise and are watching over their shoulders. Well, now the story doesn't end there because the reporter on that beat had to spend 30 minutes counterback because he was filming illegally, well, supposedly. How's that possible when, uh, well, that's what the security personnel supervising the exercise told him and subsequently caused his arrest. Latif tells his story after he left the Tessano police station. He was with me earlier on news desk. In the car on our way to the Tessano police station, I tried explaining to the police officer because he raised an issue and I was trying to clarify why we were filming. Then the military man asked me to shut up he threatened me in the car that I should shut up, otherwise... When you were only responding to a to question? To what the, the police officer had said. I was trying to explain. He asked me to shut up, otherwise he's going to do whatever to me in the car. And that was intimidation? It, he was intimidating me. Mm. So I kept quiet in the car till we got down. And then this same guy who said he's the PSO, when I was walking to the police officer there, he came, stood by me and walked with me and he was telling me, he said, you are with multimedia. I'm going to show you our powers and you'll be be behind mm -hmm. bars for weeks. For, so how long did you stay uh, at the uh, which counter back really? Tessano police station, the, the police depot. How long were you there? For about 30 minutes I was there and he asked my cameraman to go back to the office and leave me alone and he's going to lock me up. Oh, so, so while there did you have any interaction with the police? Did they tell you why they had to put you there at all? You see when we got to the police station he asked this police officer who he asked earlier to arrest me to tell the one in charge at the Tessano police station what the charges are and this guy wasn't able to make any reasonable case so the police officer in charge at Tessano didn't understand why he should lock me up mm. so he asked me to sit at the counter for about 20 minutes this guy wasn't coming back so he walked out to him and asked why do you want me to lock this guy up you've not given us any charges you've not said anything why do you want us to lock him up? He asked him to go and then wait for him for a while. After 15 minutes, he didn't come. He went back again, got back to me and said I should just walk away. We can now take some business stories. Don't go away. Well, in business, the city has seen a marginal appreciation since last week in what appears to be a positive response to new measures adopted by the Bank of Ghana. But currency analysts are worried the marginal gains may not be sustainable. Etonam say has more. The Bank of Ghana from the 24th of June somewhere last week began injecting 20 million U.S. dollars daily into the system. A move, they say, would help stabilize the city. This year alone, the city has depreciated to over 25%. What has been the impact of this move on the city? We're here to find out. At most of the forex bureaus we visited, the city appeared to be staging a fight back. The ailing Ghanaian currency, which has lost almost 50% of its value over the last 18 months, 
analysts attribute resurgence of the city to the decision by the Bank of Ghana to inject $20 million onto the currency markets daily. Analyst Kofi Ampa lost the intervention of the Bank of Ghana but charges government to more sustainable measures. This problem that we've been facing as a country is something that has been occurring year in, year out. I mean, since we did the redenomination of the currency, we've never seen the city um, you know, really gaining value from then. I mean, if you look at the city's rate of depreciation from then till now, it's about 99.9%. .9%. Okay, so it clearly b brings us back to the basic structure of the economy. I mean, we, we seem to be, for the long term, there should be policies that will arrest the idea of importing everything into the country. But the manager of Daula Forex Bureau describes the marginal ap appreciation of the city as superficial. Uh, we expect that if the Bank of Ghana says that they are injecting $20 million every day, people will be rushing to uh, change their foreign currencies in order not to lose. Because assuming you have $1,000 and uh, the current rate is, let's say, 4.8, and uh, you anticipate that uh, it will fall. You will rush to go and change, but we don't see such a thing. Financial analyst Sidney Kisley Hayford believes the Bank of Ghana does not have enough money to continually be pumping $20 million daily onto the market. The Bank of Ghana says it is going to put $20 million every day into the economy to shore up the CD. I said that it's a lie because the Bank of Ghana does not have $600 million to do this for a whole month. If they do it for three months, it will cost us $1.8 billion, and they don't have that kind of money. So it's not possible. Um, $114 million is a drop in the ocean. And can we wait until September when that money comes in before it makes any difference? The answer is no. Eton Amsi, Joy News. The Association of Ghana Industries is calling on government to put in place the necessary infrastructure to encourage business to operate eff effectively. Reacting to concerns that some businesses evade taxes, Chief Executive of ADI said Chuma Kwabwa says the business environment does not encourage tax compliance. Uh, I believe that our businesses uh, are not, I mean, probably set up to evade taxes. But then if we make uh, the system friendly if we provide the needed incentives for businesses to actually pay taxes definitely they will do it and again let me also mention that when businesses realize that their taxes are put to good use if you go to industrial areas industrial enclaves you realize that i mean infrastructure there you know uh, would let you ask questions like uh, why do i pay taxes uh, quite recently during the uh, the June 3rd disaster. You would see a situation where industries in the uh, north uh, industrial area in Accra, I mean, getting flooded, a particular company had about 60 of its equipment all flooded, and many more of our members. So if we keep on paying the taxes, and then we don't see common infrastructural amenities like drains, desilting, and even roads. There are places where roads have been awarded on contract. But then articulated trucks are saying that they won't move from there for the roads to be constructed. You see, these are challenges. So uh, it's a bit worrying when we uh, more or less are called on say, educate your members, let them pay taxes. We really want to see that especially industrial zones are being provided, I mean, with the necessary infrastructure to be able to carry out their legitimate businesses. That's it for the business news segment. Up next is Sports with Benedict Ozu. Well, from Sports, let's check out some other stories where exhibitors and patrons of the 2015 Joy FM Beauty and Bridal Fair have commended uh, the station for organizing a successful event. The Bridal Fair, 16th in the series, brought wedding planners, retailers, as well as service providers closer to those looking to have an exceptional noob show. As the fair ended on Sunday, exhibitors and patrons were already anticipating next year's event. You tell all the boys. From the invitation cards to walking down the aisle in an exquisite gown, having a colorful reception, and finally getting to your dream honeymoon destination, everything that you expect to make your wedding extraordinary 
was on display at the Joy FM Beauty and Bridal Fair. Since the fair opened on Thursday, June 2, thousands of patrons have trooped to the stands, overwhelming exhibitors. There were so many people here yesterday. That there's been a bigger crowd as compared to last year. And there have been so many couples that are coming in to make inquiries and to, to sign up um, service providers and things. So I think it's been excellent. We're actually giving 50% discounts. That's how people are buying. People come and buy a lot at the fair. And then even after the fair, I have so many clients walking in as well to buy. And it's given me a lot of publicity. We've enjoyed ourselves. Customers have been here in and out. Um, I can think of giving about 2,000 pieces of um, our complimentary card. And people are still coming. People are buying. Um, yesterday, we had to um, go in and bring some more stuff because um, the shop was um, getting empty. It is an event that unmarried people do not want to miss. I really like the wedding, so I really go there just to have a look at the mass wedding. And anytime I come here, I do a lot of patronage, so I really like it. And for those who are already married, it is the time of the year to see to their beauty needs. Actually, I want a place to fix my hair. That's why I'm around. Yeah, just to get and do a little trimmings here and there. Every year I come to the bridal fair with the kids. The highlight of this year's event was arguably the fashion show that saw professional models strutting in some of the most amazing outfits created by Ghanaian designers. You tell all the boys no. Make sure this undoubtedly has been an event well organized to suit the needs of the 21st century bride. Every little aspect of the whole four-day event has been uh, something to look forward to. Uh, even from the variety of food outside of the food court, the variety of the exhibitions that we've had. But you can't forget about the uh, fashion show. It was fantastic. And, uh, you know, watching the guys and girls walk up and down the, the uh, catwalk was just a fantastic thing. The other thing was also the scope or the, the range of conversations that we had on the repackaged marriage uh, talk. I think it was a great uh, addition. I think next year we're definitely going to do something spectacularly different. Uh, the splendor you see this year, we will up the ante next year. It's been an exciting four days for exhibitors and patrons. Several connections have been made. And so if you participated in this fair, then you know where to get what when planning your wedding. Remember, it's all about making your wedding an exceptional one. And the Joy FM Beauty and Bridal Fair seeks to do exactly that. From the Accra International Conference Centre, Adelaide Arthur for Joy News. Well, when Felix Nyaba had his wedding in February 2014, the bridal team included five flower girls. 34 days after the wedding, Felix was then accused of defiling one of them. He was sentenced to three years in prison for indecent assault and spent four months in the Insawa Medium Security Prison. On Saturday, July 4, 2015, he walked out as a free man. He tells Joy News his story. Uh, it was level against me uh, just 34 days after my wedding and the little girl that in this case happened to be one of uh, uh, flower girls that was part of my wedding process so I was uh, being accused of defiling the girl by the mother and we went to court and there was no any evidence that have uh, defiled the girl. And even before we got to the court, the police themselves who investigated the case get to know that there was no any defilement case against me. So they charged me for indecent assault. We went to court, there was no any evidence of uh, indecent assault perpetrated by me. And we went through the procedures and then uh, they, they just sentenced me to three years in prison. Did you have a lawyer then? Yeah, I have a lawyer. I have been from the one that uh, I was picked up by the police. I, my lawyer got involved. I wrote my statement in the presence of my lawyer and we proceeded to court. Uh, was this girl close to you or anything of the sort? Yes, she was close to me because uh, we live uh, in the same area and adjacent to each other. And one fundamental thing is that uh, the girl and her elder sisters used to come to watch TV in my room.
and the woman herself keep her food stuff in the fridge. And whenever she needed it, she sent the children for it or she comes for it herself. So all these things were happening before she made this allegation against me. His lawyer, Francis Xavier Sousa, says they intend to seek compensation of two men in Ghana cities for wrongful internment, internment of Felix. In the first place, what happened could be described as a malicious prosecution. And we intend bringing an action in that direction against this woman who instigated this whole situation. Um, beyond that, when you look at Article 14 of the 1992 Constitution, it makes provision for um, compensation for persons who have either served part or whole of their sentences um, and who eventually were acquitted, uh, uh, acquitted and discharged on appeal. And this is a typical case in which felons have served some sentence already. Don't forget that upon this conviction and sentence, uh, his education was interrupted because he was a final year student at GIJ doing his degree. Um, you know, he had to leave his nine-month-old nine baby in the house. Um, he had suffered a lot of humiliation, um, a lot of, um, if you like, uh, psychological and emotional trauma as a result of all this so he needs to be compensated for this wrongful conviction so we are definitely going to bring an action and we are seeking nothing less than a two million Ghana cities for his compensation when do you intend filing this um, we are sure that before this week is over we definitely will be filing the writ against the state Let's go elsewhere outside of the country for more story so staying to, through the program I'm grateful for your time, my name is Kimini Nyamani Amana. Visit myjawline.com for more news.